The climate crisis is not something beyond the horizon. It is already here. Om 2000 år måske, så er man i København. Det er helt drukne, fordi der, der er så mange isbjerg, der er smeltet. Og det vil vi ikke have, fordi så skal vi flytte til et andet land, hvor vi skal tale et helt andet sprog, som mange af os ikke kan. The summit marks an important step in achieving green growth and the global goals. Man kan vælge om en verden, hvor der hvor vulkaner springer og isbjerg falder ned. Eller man kan vælge en verden, hvor træerne er grønne, er grønne og skoven er fine. We need to accelerate concrete solutions that can be scaled and replicated all over the world. The P4G summit will do exactly that. On behalf of the Danish government, the city of Copenhagen and the P4G, I would like to welcome you to the P4G Copenhagen summit. Jeg håber virkelig vi når at man passer bedre på jorden. Vi vi ikke passer godt på jorden indtil nu, så skal vi være hurtigt til at finde en ny jord. We need less talk and more action to tackle climate change and create the sustainable future we want. We will achieve our aims by working together. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Melinda Crane. Good morning. Good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to the P4G Copenhagen Summit. It is a great honor to be with you as moderator, both today and tomorrow. We are here for a reason that couldn't be more crucial. The film reminded us we are here to forge ties that can help to save our planet. If we are serious about the goals that we signed up to three years ago, the Paris climate targets and also the 2030 agenda of sustainable development goals, we need to act now. That is clearer than ever after last week's unusually urgent warning by the client scientists of the UN IPCC. This summit is all about action. It's about accelerating innovation, accelerating business models and financial flows that can produce real change on the ground right now. And most especially, it's about connecting up with others who are doing the same. Stopping climate change, sparking inclusive growth, that is not something that any of us can do acting alone. Partnerships are the way forward. And that's where P4G comes in. Partnering for green growth and global go goals 2030, those are the four Gs, that is a global initiative with a big ambition, namely to become the leading forum for catalyzing partnerships with impact. Partnerships that forge ties across sectoral and also national boundaries, Partnerships that drive collaboration, not only between business and government, but with civil society and academia. Partnerships that take the private sector seriously when it says it wants to be part of the solution. Without the involvement of business, with its innovative capacity, with its resources, the change that we need is simply going to elude us. And that's why we open this inaugural P4G Summit right here in the Confederation of Danish Industries. And in case you're wondering why we're spread out across several rooms, and uh, welcome to all of those who are watching in the big screens in the other rooms, it's because of the buzz that this summit has generated. We started out by booking this hall, then we added two more rooms uh, right here in the Confederation, and when we discovered that the numbers were still growing, we had to scurry over next door and book the Hans Christian Andersen Castle in Tivoli, which seems to me to be quite fitting because frankly, mobilizing this kind of cra a crowd for an inaugural summit is something of a fairy tale. So do bear with us, please, if you are in one of the other rooms watching us on the big screens. I promise that I will certainly visit at least one other room in the course of the morning. The summit will pay special attention to cities throughout today and tomorrow. 
not only because rapid urbanization is triggering, triggering an enormous demand for sustainable solutions, but also because cities are the place where a lot of the most exciting innovation is taking place. And we couldn't have found a better city to host this gathering than Copenhagen, a city that leads by example, a city that has set itself the goal of becoming the world's first climate neutral city by 2025. So that's why we're here. And now it is a pleasure to begin with greetings from our hosts. Please welcome the CEO of the Confederation of Danish Industries. Under his leadership, the Confederation is taking an active role in fostering the public-private partnerships that can enable Danish companies to be part of the solution to help achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Please give a very, very warm welcome to our host, Carsten Dibla. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I could also ask the question, why are we here? And before we get too philosophical about this, let me give the practical answer. We are here today because Denmark's Prime Minister, Lars Løkke Rasmussen, has chosen to open the very first P4G summit here in our headquarters, the Confederation of Danish Industry. We are honored and delighted that the Prime Minister made that choice. And we think that joining forces here at the opening today perfectly reflects P4G's mission of public-private partnerships. It reflects the crucial role that the private sector plays in building a better world for ourselves, for our children, and for our grandchildren. Only Innovative companies can deliver many of the new solutions we need to ensure clean water, sustainable energy, and food for all. In order to deliver on the Paris Agreement and the global goals, business must play its part alongside governments and other organizations in civil society. This is exactly the point of P4G's mission, as should be clear from the name, Partnerships for Green Growth and the Global Goals. Partnerships are also something we have a very strong tradition for in Denmark. For example, partnerships between the employers and the employees, which, I think I can say, constitute the Danish labor market model. Every second or third year, employers and employees collectively bargain to agree on wages and work conditions in general. It's an ongoing partnership based on trust and cooperation. That is not to say perfect harmony, of course. True partnerships are seldom easy. Clint Eastwood, the actor, once said, they say that all marriages are made in heaven, but so are thunder and lightning. <laughs> and uh, well, I have known my wife for 39 years, so I can certainly testify to that. And I can also testify that there is sometimes thunder and lightning in employer labor relations. But our collaboration has enabled results which none of us could have achieved in our own right. Results for companies, for employers, and for all in society. In my opinion, the Danish labor market model is among the most important factors in Denmark's development into a both prosperous, business-friendly, and relatively equal society with widespread opportunity. And to me, it proves the basic principle behind the global goals. We must collaborate if we are to achieve the most ambitious goals ever set by the nations of the world. It is also the foundational idea of P4G. 
This is why we are here today together. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much, Karsten Dievat, for that truly resounding affirmation of the Danish collaborative business labor model. Very impressive indeed. We hear now, ladies and gentlemen, from a political leader whose deep commitment to driving forward sustainability has played a major role in putting it on the global agenda. Most recently, he served as co-chair of the UN Summit on Sustainable Development, at which the 2030 Agenda was signed. It is a great honor to hand over the stage to the Prime Minister of Denmark, His Excellency Lars Lüge Rasmussen. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the very first P4G Summit in Copenhagen. I am truly delighted to see such broad representation from 53 countries. Governments and global companies, international organizations and civil society, startups and universities. All of you are most welcome. And you are here for a reason, to bring hope and practical solutions to a world in need of it. The world has become a much better place during the last decades. Declining poverty and child mortality, increasing lifetime expectancy. Despite these positive developments, we are, however, still facing huge challenges. And the biggest, perhaps, is climate change. Only last week, the IPCC reminded us of the dreadful consequences ahead and the hurry we are in. If we do not act, and if we do not act now, climate change could spin out of control, putting our ecosystems on the line, our future at stake. And no government can solve these challenges alone. Neither can academia or civil society, nor any sector or company. The only way to deal with the biggest challenge of our time is to partner up across continents and cultures, countries and cities. Three years ago, I had the privilege to co-chair the historic UN meeting in New York, where the world adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And later that year, the world agreed on the Paris Agreement as well. Two iconic agreements which bring hope and a roadmap to the future. Yet, we still have to walk all the miles ourselves, and we will only make it in time if we start to do things differently. We do not need business as usual. We need business unusual. We do not need half-hearted commitments we need big ambitions. We do not need any more words. We need action. And this is why P4G was launched last year in New York. An alliance of global leaders working to build and scale public-private partnerships. We must turn global commitments into sustainable business models. Today, more than 1.2 billion people do not have access to electricity, let alone electricity from renewable sources. About one-third of all food produced for human consumptions goes to waste, corresponding to 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions. More than 2 billion people lack access to safe water at home, and every minute Around 1 million plastic bottles are bought worldwide, but only 7% are recycled into new bottles. These are areas in urgent need for solutions, but they also represent vast business opportunities for companies involved in water, energy, food, city planning, and circular economy. Turning only one year old, the P4G consists of Denmark, Chile, 
Ethiopia, Kenya, South Korea, Vietnam, Mexico, Colombia and the Netherlands. And many other countries have expressed their interest and have joined us here today. And in the first call for proposals, the P4G Partnership Fund received more than 450 applications from over 80 different countries, far more than we could expect it. To me, this indicates that we have hit a nerve, a global trend of immense possibilities and tractions. The first P4G partnerships are now being put to work to make a difference, bringing hope. Partnerships that will help electrify rural Africa, provide safe drinking water for vulnerable populations, and replace diesel buses with clean alternatives in Latin America, just to mention a few. Today, we meet from across, across continents, sectors, and generations to learn from the very best and scale for impact. We meet to show the world that strong partnerships can do and what an alliance of action can bring. But first and foremost, we are here because we care. We care about the world we live in. We care about the future of our children. So I would just suggest that we roll up our sleeves and get to work. Welcome, all of you. Thank you very, very much, Prime Minister. That is exactly what we're going to be doing, and we will take your thoughts with us uh, into our discussions both today and uh, tomorrow. And I look forward to introducing you once again also on day two when we will hear from a number of those P4G partner countries that you just listed. So many thanks for that. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me just five very brief uh, notes on organizational matters before we proceed with our agenda. And uh, I would like to start out with our website. We can uh, all check the website to find out more about our events, but also for more background on P4G. So the website, quite simply, uh, easy to find, p4gsummit.org. Secondly, we are very eager to send a message out to the world. So please, if you hear something noteworthy, if you want to share some of the messages here at the summit, do uh, send them out via hashtag P4G Summit. Also easy to find on Twitter. Thirdly, we've got an event app. It is also P4G Summit. It's available for Android and uh, for Apple. And please do download it so that we can try to minimize paper. Again, you'll find all the background on our agenda, our speakers, and of course, on P4G itself. And um, you can also submit your own comments and your questions, including to the two panels that are coming up. And we're very, very eager to hear from you. In a summit all about partnership, your input really matters. So please, uh, send us your questions and comments. And you're going to be able to use this app for voting purposes later on uh, today. So please be sure that you do have it downloaded by then. Fourthly, some of our speakers will not be speaking English. Uh, we do have speakers from all over the world, so we have headsets for translation, and I encourage you to get hold of one if you would like a translation. And for that, and in general, for all matters where you have questions, they, those questions will be answered by our very, very competent help desk. And we've also got these fantastic runners out there that you can recognize with dark blue shirts with SDG logos, and they will also help you uh, if you are in need of support. And finally, please do wear your lanyards, your badges at all times. Uh, you do need them for security purposes and also to get into planned activities. So that uh, was the housekeeping hints part of it. And now just a very quick outlook on what's in store today. We're going to be starting out in our next two sessions with the big picture. We've got two panels of outstanding global leaders. The first will share insights and experiences on their own engagement in public-private partnerships that are already delivering results on the ground. As the Prime Minister reminded us, it's all about action now. 
The second panel will talk about how innovative financial strategies and, uh, and business models are already leveraging investment in sustainable solutions. And later on in the morning, we will have an opportunity to get better acquainted with P4G itself. The organization's global director will introduce us to eight promising partnerships that have been selected as finalists for support of up to $1 million in scale-up funding. And we will find out tomorrow, at the end of our second day, uh, which lucky partnerships, in fact, will uh, be getting that money. So after that, in the afternoon today, we're going to go hands-on with a series of breakout sessions that cover the P4G sectors. That means food and water, energy, mobility, and waste reduction, circular economy. Tomorrow, we move over to the very beautiful Danish concert, Radio Concert Hall. Members of the Danish Royal Court, as well as heads of state, CEOs, leaders of civil society and organizations will both review the messages from today and take a deeper dive with us on our overarching themes, recognizing state-of-the-art partnerships at the P4G Awards ceremony, where we'll also announce the final results of P4G scale-up funding. So that is what's in store. It's a really intensive and really exciting program. And we move on now to our first panel, which is entitled Harvesting the SDG Business Opportunities Through Partnerships. And as both of our introductory speakers, the Prime Minister and uh, the CEO of the Confederation of Danish Industries reminded us, sustainability simply makes good business sense. Demographic trends like urbanization and population growth do pose challenges, of course, but they can also pay dividends if we meet them wisely. It's been estimated that the 2030 agenda could create opportunities worth more than $12 trillion across markets ranging from food and agriculture to urban development and mobility, energy and health. We've put together a very high-ranking panel of global leaders from the private and the public sectors, as well as civil society, who are already partnering with other actors to maximize those opportunities across a whole range of sectors. So it's my pleasure to now ask the panel participants to come to the stage as I read off their names. And I begin with Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister Tharman, who as Coordinating Minister for Economic and Social Policies is deeply engaged in promoting lifelong learning initiatives. A pleasure to meet you, and you may take this place right here. Thank you so much. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome Paul Polman. He is CEO of Unilever, co-founder of the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, and also a member of the SDG Advocacy Group. Wonderful to have you with us as well. And I'm very pleased to introduce Søren Sko. He is CEO of the world's largest shipping company. Welcome, Søren, which is intensifying its focus on sustainability with, among other things, initiatives to decarbonize logistics and also to reduce food waste, where, of course, the supply chain is a very, very important component. So great to have you with us. And we're awfully glad uh, that Isbrand Ho can join us. He is the managing director of the Chinese company BYD's European operations. And BYD Europe is absolutely pushing the frontiers of electric mobility in Europe. And finally, I'm very pleased to see once again Andrew Steer, who is CEO of the World Resources Institute, a global think and action tank. <laughs> Probably most of you know WRI, it focuses on environmental issues and sustainable resource use. So I'm going to start out, dear gentlemen, by asking you to please just give us a brief introductory uh, point of view, and when I say brief, I mean about two minutes per person, um, on what business opportunities you and your organizations, be they companies, be they uh, civil society organizations, 
do see in the SDGs? What business opportunities you see in the SDGs, and who needs to do what to maximize those opportunities? And I'll start with the Deputy Prime Minister, please. Well, well thank, thank you very much, and thank you, Prime Minister Rasmussen, for inviting me. Um, I think I represent a government rather than a business corporation, but collaboration uh, with our partners, business, civil society, and our international partners has been intrinsic. Uh, to our whole approach in Singapore. Uh, and I'll just highlight a couple of uh, examples of this. Um, one has to do with innovation, uh, the other has to do with finance. Uh, in innovation, uh, there's no way that Singapore, as a small country, with our research institutions, our academics, uh, and our businesses, uh, can do it on its own. Uh, but we are pioneering new technologies for sustainability together with others. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, for a bit of context, uh, Singapore is uh, just a city-state in the tropics, so we are space-constrained, we are water-constrained, and we are energy-constrained. Actually, it means zero. We have no energy. Uh, we are a constrained uh, city-state. We are overcoming it through innovation. Uh, solar, you might think it's in the tropics, so there's lots of sun, uh, but uh, cloud cover is actually a, a, a very uh, obvious issue uh, where, where we are. So intermittency exists in Singapore. Uh, we are overcoming it through technologies that allow us, within the limited space we have, to have floating solar panels on reservoirs, floating solar panels offshore, and now, very interestingly, and this is a technology which has tremendous promise, uh, photovoltaic technologies that are integrated in buildings, they call it building-integrated photovoltaic technology, and in particular, the scope within a densely built-up environment to have vertically installed uh, solar, solar technology <laughs> materials that allow light to be transmitted into buildings. And this is a fascinating new technology which we are working together, we are partnering with others to develop, and which we think uh, is a potential solution in densely built-up environments. But what about the, the rest of our energy requirements? We started off very early moving to natural gas, although it is more expensive, but we're now looking actively within our constraints at how we can use alternatives and renewables. We have very little wind on the small island, but we can get some of it offshore and we're actually reclaiming land in order to have a long wind tunnel. We are, we've invested in waste to energy. That's itself a very important part of uh, renewability. Uh, and we're using biofuels. And the important issue, given intermittency when it comes to solar and wind, is how we can develop microgrids and link up microgrids around the island. And this is where there's a very important initiative led by one of our universities, Nanyang Technological University, together with NGO France, uh, EDF Energy in uh, the UK, uh, and one of our own companies, Keppel. Uh, international partnership, but they are the frontiers of creating the largest microgrid uh, test platform uh, in, in, in Asia. Uh, it, just an example of how partnerships and thinking ahead and overcoming your constraints uh, is, leads to results that are often surprising but we've got to keep surprising ourselves. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we could rethink the old proverb um, and say that constraints are the mother of invention. And uh, I'm very glad you spoke uh, about energy because, of course, energy is a very important sector for P4G. We're going to be talking about it at great length. Uh, so that was an excellent input for that. Let us move uh, right down the panel and uh, come to Paul Polman uh, for his view. Yeah, I would even take uh, one step back for a second and why we have the SDGs in the first place. The SDGs are here to finish a job that we started in 2000 when Kofi Annan introduced the Millennial Development Goals and said we're going to halve the number of people living in poverty in this world, at that time defined as $1.25 a day, and lo and behold, we've actually achieved that in the 15 years. Now we came to 2015 and we have 193 countries in the world come together in the UN in September and simply say we're going to finish the job. In the next 15 years, we're going to irreversibly eradicate poverty and do that in a more sustainable and equitable way. The reason business is interested, obviously, is that there is no business case in enduring poverty. We don't have much business in Sub-Sahara Africa, in the Middle East right now, or in many other countries in the world. So 
Uh, it is uh, uh, 17 goals is obviously a lot, 169 targets is even more for business to really digest that. So we created a commission under the leadership of Mark Mollock Brown, which was the Business and Sustainable Development Commission. And in that commission, we just looked at four areas and found the opportunity to be $12 trillion, 380 million jobs at the time that we needed it most. It probably is the biggest business opportunity. And frankly, it's a scorecard on the one hand of the world's failures or gaps that we still have, and it's an opportunity on the other side if you want to fill these gaps. Because we've waited so long, in any of these 17 goals that we have, we find now that the cost of acting is actually cheaper than the cost of not acting. To implement all the sustainable development goals would cost the world about three to five trillion dollars a year. Sounds like a lot of money for all of us, but to keep it simple, it's about three to five percent of the global economy. If you look at any of the goals, we're actually already on each of the goals, probably spending more by not acting. Climate change, according to the IMF, is estimated to cost us $5.3 trillion a year. Keeping women, goal number five, gender equality, uh, g giving women not the same access to education or land rights or financing, according to McKinsey, can cost us up to $20 trillion a year. The uh, cost of wars and conflict prevention, goal number 12, which, uh, uh, 16, sorry, goal number 16, which is called peace and justice, is costing the world 10 to 12 percent of the global GDP. So we are willing to spend three to four times more on some of these individual goals than it costs us to implement the whole thing. So that also means that if we work together to find these solutions, there is an enormous payout for business in any of these goals. We've come to the level that we've been around for long enough and tried so many things, and we clearly haven't gotten to where we need to be. The challenges that we now have to make this world function for all are enormous. We have to decarbonize the global economy, we have to move to a circular economy away from a linear consumption pattern, we have to make the financial markets longer term, we have to figure out how to make it more inclusive, and frankly, may I say, next to the DPM, we have to do that at a time when global governance isn't quite functioning. And, and actually dysfunctioning, I would argue. Mm -hmm. So this is an enormous challenge, and it can only be done if we work together uh, in partnership. We're, for example, looking a lot at the food and land use system, where on the one hand we cut all the forests of the world as if it's nothing, then we keep the poor farmers in subsistence, that's where all the poverty is, then we have them as monocrops, so they do all the stunting, then we have the audacity to waste all the food, 30-40% in between, and on the other side we're creating the biggest issue of that the world has ever seen of obesity, with two billion people now being overweight or, or uh, obese. So, and then, by the way, we have the audacity to call ourselves the most intelligent species. So, if we work together uh, across this value chain, if we work together, if we work together across this value chain with all parties involved, we need policies, we need technologies, we need infrastructures, we need uh, demand side, we need training, uh, capability building, etc. It can only be done if we work together. The famous African proverb, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And that is what we're trying to do across all these SDGs. And frankly, I'll end here. It probably is the biggest business opportunity that mankind has ever seen. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> A very helpful systemic perspective there. Thank you. Sir in school. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Paul Pullman quite clearly outlined, the uh, uh, sustainable development goals, they are, if you will, the biggest issues that uh, they are faced uh, by the global community. And I, for one, uh, being a CEO of a big uh, company, believe that it's very important that uh, the that uh, the UN and the, uh, the, the development goals clearly recognize that business is uh, a force for good here. Business is part of the solution more than it's part of the problem if we want to uh, achieve, the, uh, achieve the goals. I grew up in the, as a child in the 70s where being a multinational company usually was not a good thing. You were seen as somebody who would want to exploit and... Uh, and, and, and the, the so, uh, so I do believe we can make as big business a real difference here. Our company have, uh, is, is a truly global company. We operate with our own people in more than 120 countries. We facilitate global trade. One in every five containers that move around in the world move on our, uh, on, on our, on our network. And every single one of the sustainable development goals actually touch our business in some way, shape or form. 
But what we have done is we have decided that there are, there are five or six of them where we can make a real impact with what we know, what our resources are, uh, the skills that we have, and, and we are focusing on those. Uh, some of the most important one uh, is, uh, is, is hunger, uh, zero hunger. Uh, so, so we work on the, the problem that Paul also mentioned, food loss. 25% of all containers that move around the world with, with food move actually on our network. Mm -hmm. and, and we want to uh, extend that in, inland so that all the, it gets all the way to the farms. Because the food loss is because of lack of cold chains. It's a solvable problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we know what to do. We don't have to invent a lot of new technology either. Uh, another big uh, uh, sustainable development goal for us is climate action. <clears throat> we, we burn a lot of... Uh, fossil fuels in our company, actually pretty much as much as the state of Denmark. And, and therefore we have actually over the last five years worked very hard to bring down our uh, consumption of fuel. We have set ourselves a target of 60% reduction on a 27, 2007 um, uh, uh, baseline and we are today at 43% reduction. Uh, and it's looking pretty hard to get to, to 60, but I'm sure we're going to work it out somehow. Uh, and I could give many other, uh, other examples. I just want to end by saying that uh, I do believe that the trade, that nations that trade with each other, that, that uh, businesses and, and people trade with us will continue to drive global prosperity, growth, and, and jobs, and we will all uh, be better off uh, for it. But we need to work very closely to to, to, with governments to make sure we have a, a level playing field, that, <clears throat> that there's transparency, and that we are able to power, empower all businesses, also the small ones, to trade in the global market. Thanks Thank very you. much. And I know that you are also working together, even with some of your competitors, to, um, on the decarbonization and sulfur reduction piece. Uh, coalitions have played a big yes. role in that. Isbrandho, your perspective, if you would. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Is it working? Okay. Yeah. I hope my voice is sustainable as much as this group here today. I do apologize for that. I'm asked to come here to talk about partnership, and I want to give you one example. That's very important. Our company, BYD, it's probably a name that you have never heard of in terms of electric mobility, but we are the largest by far in terms of electric product, electric mobility products in the world. I remember five years ago, I was in Brussels attending a bus world conference, at which time everybody laughed at BYD for supplying the only electric bus on the stand in 2013. We were laughed at because who would use electric bus? However, with the partnership, that changed the whole landscape. We worked very closely with London, with Transport for London, TFL. They decided to purchase the first two electric buses in whole Europe. Now today, with an additional partnership with one of our Scottish companies, ADL, we have achieved the impossible. In London today, 90% of the buses, electric buses that you see on the streets are BYD buses. 50% in the UK, 25% in the whole Europe. I was in IAA, the largest industrial equipment show last month in Hanover. Nobody was laughing everybody is showing some kind of electric product. So this is sustainable. And I mentioned earlier two names, TFL, Transport for London, a good partner to begin the journey with, and then ADL, a partner that we're building our vehicles in the UK, so it's no longer a threat to the local economy, no longer a threat to local employment. And I believe these kind of partnership, it's, it's, it's existing everywhere, and we're looking forward to working with other partners and developing additional partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Andrew Steer, last word for Thanks. this round. For Thank this you, round. We're Melinda. Keep Thank you, uh, Prime Minister. Thank you, Minister Tornes. Thank you, Denmark, for putting on this remarkable event. And congratulations to the other eight uh, uh, national governments that are founding members of P4G. This is a very exciting event. What you're hearing here is, is part of an amazing intellectual and practical revolution that's taking place. Just 10 years ago, the overwhelming view was if you wanted to be sustainable, that was nice, but you'd have to give something up in terms of growth, in terms of profit, in terms of yield. Five years ago, the view was actually you can have sustainability 
and growth. The view today now, we're in the third phase, which is the only way you can have growth and profitability over the longer term is sustainability. This is an amazing change, and it's not actually only these incredible leaders here that believe it. If you look at financial markets, they're now starting to believe it. Just five years ago, if you went in with a financial portfolio and said, I want to allocate my resources to a portfolio of stocks, and I want to allocate them to companies that have high ESG, as it's called, you'd be told, well, that's very nice, but you'll get lower yield. Mm. Now the evidence is overwhelming that companies that have high ESG actually do better. And this is an amazing development. And that's why, for example, 500 major international companies have now signed up for what are called science-based targets, which means every single year we're going to be transparent about our emissions, and we're going to set a long-term goal for total decarbonization throughout our entire supply chain. Now, why are they doing that? They're not doing it because any government's telling them to. They're doing it because they know it's good for the long term. Now, the interesting thing about the P for G, if you look at the five areas of them, cities, the five areas that are focused on fit, cities, energy, agriculture, water, circular economy, none of them actually say climate change. And this gets to the second revolution. Just three years ago, people were saying, oh, it's so confusing. They're the sustainable as sustainable development goals over here, and then there's the Paris deal, which should we do? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, if you do the sustainable development goals, these things here, you will actually achieve the Paris goal. And this is a remarkable thing. And essentially what the 1.5 degree report last week said is look at these sustainability goals and accelerate them so we get system-wide change at a pace that we've never had in the history of the world before, and you will get to where you need to get to, and you will achieve the sustainable development goals. Here's the point, though. To go at the pace, the scale, and the reach that is required, no corporation, no government, no international institution, no NGO can do it on their own. Every single issue that we need to deal with requires that special source, that combination of public, private, civil society, science to come together. And that's what this P4G meeting is all about. Thank you very much. And that's why, in fact, um, the... the the subtitle under our overarching title is Accelerating Partnerships for exactly that reason. We really need to expand and scale up. So let me come back to all of the panel with a couple of specific follow-up questions. And to you, Deputy Prime Minister, if you would just talk a little bit about collaboration and partnership in another area where constraint has actually put Singapore at the forefront, and I'm talking about skills. You have one of the most educated workforces population populations in the world, largely due to the fact that you don't have a lot of other resources. So could you just say a word, I know you're deeply committed to lifelong learning initiatives, about how you see collaboration and skills playing into this discussion about opportunities uh, in sustainability? Well, um, you know, the spirit of Paul's remarks and what the Prime Minister mentioned earlier, let me just start by hi highlighting the urgency uh, and scale of the problem we face. Uh, the next decade is going to be quite unlike any decade we've seen previously in two major regards. First, the number of young people in the developing world, principally in Africa and parts of South Asia, who are going to be coming of working age, significantly exceeds anything in any previous decade. It's a bulge and we are completely unprepared for it. We are completely unprepared in terms of our ability to create jobs, to create a sense of wanting to participate uh, in a modern economy, and the consequences of failure are not going to be merely economic consequences, and they're not going to be restricted to the countries concerned. The countries concerned and the global community are completely unprepared for this, and it requires some new approaches. It requires some governance unusual, to borrow the Prime Minister's uh, term. The second thing that uh, we have to recognize is that the amount of infrastructure alone, physical infrastructure, that's going to be put in place because of urbanization, just in the next decade, 
uh, is going to be roughly double the existing infrastructure of the world. Let's say 15 years. In the next 15 years, we're going to double the world's infrastructure. And if we don't build sustainability into it now, we are locking ourselves in to failure. Yeah. We are locking ourselves into failure on sustainability for a very long time to come. So the next decade is critical. How do we create jobs on a much more significant scale than has been done so far? How do you catalyze private investment to do it? And how do you find the finance for sustainable infrastructure? And there are ways of doing this. And if I just stick to the, the, the area of financial strategy and risk strategies, the basic problem is we are attracting far too little private investment into a substantial part of the developing world. Risk is an issue. And we have to de-risk economies, not just de-risk projects, we have to de-risk economies. And we're not utilizing some of the basic tools that have been developed in finance. They're used in the advanced world, they're used when it comes to fancy areas, but we're not utilizing some of the most basic tools. And that involves the pooling of risk, pooling and diversifying risk. Firstly, political risk insurance, quite apart from improving governance, which is, of course, the most important solution, improving governance country by country, with citizens and civil society being part of that force for change. But we've got to use political risk insurance and pool it across regions, across political geographies, and the means exist for this. We've just made a proposal under a different group, an eminent persons group uh, for the G20, which I happen to chair uh, for this solution. Second proposal is to pool together underlying assets and infrastructure across geographies so as to be able to securitize them and attract in the institutional investors. Institutional investors today, the pension funds, the insurance funds, the sovereign wealth funds, are barely invested in developing country infrastructure. In fact, it's minuscule. So, Providing a large-scale, simple asset class that allows institutional investors to participate is absolutely critical, and it can be done. Just a word on skills, if you would. That's a great setup also so for the Singa next no, panel. I mean, Singapore, Sorry. Singapore is an example on skills because yeah. we, we obviously have to take it very seriously. Uh, and we're very happy to, to share our lessons, to export our lessons. We just had the World's Bank, World Bank's uh, Human Capital Index that was launched last week, we happen to be on top, but I mean, the point is, we all need some humility because the game is never over for any of us, but we're very happy to share our lessons. How do you organize education, basic education, tertiary education that provides equitable access for everyone regardless of social background and gender? How do you keep people moving through their lives, which is the real critical game in education now? It's not so much education as much as lifelong learning, but how do you get people to keep moving through their lives within a career, within a set of careers, and in order to fulfill their fullest potential? And exactly with that youth bulge, such a, such a critical question. So many thanks for that. By the way, on financial issues, we have a whole panel coming up. So I'm going to ask us to probably just let that message stand, but maybe not uh, deepen it, or we're going to run out of time before we've finished uh, what uh, we want to talk about on this panel. And Paul Pullman, let me ask you to talk a little bit more about the kind of partnering you're doing in the food sector in order to reduce waste. Yeah, I, I know you've entered into, uh, Unilever has entered into a partnership with the Food Loss and Waste Action yep. Group in Indonesia. And maybe you can just say a few words about, frankly, why a big company like Unilever, with its enormous resources, actually needs to partner with anyone to do that. Isn't that something you could actually just do on your own? What's the advantage, the value added in that partnership? Yeah. Before I do that, let me first acknowledge the DPM. My, um Daughter-in-law is from Indonesia, and my grandchildren now, and they are very smart people, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it does work. <coughs> the, um, the, the reason, let's not get into Unilever, the reason we need to attack food waste is uh, what I mentioned before, just the amount of cheer, amount of food that is wasted affects everybody in the, in the value chain, but above all, it's the smallholder farmer that pays the price for it. And uh, obviously, with the enormous demand of food coming up in the world, uh, the uh, food supply needs to more or less double. We need to figure out how to do that without 
challenging the uh, planetary boundaries that we have. It's in all of our interest. If you're in the food business, under the current trajectory just on climate change alone, you won't make any profit in 30 years' time. You most likely will be out of business. In fact, it's already happening as we sit here for most of the food companies. These issues of uh, uh, packaging, uh, plastics, or food waste, or climate change are actually all the same. They are pre-competitive now because what you're really talking about is the future of humanity, not the interest of each individual company. Goal number 17 in the Sustainable Development Goals is a goal of partnership, but it's not just a partnership of you and I working together. It's actually a partnership for the common good. It's a partnership that is intergenerational. It's a partnership where people understand that when they put the interest of others ahead of their own, they're actually better off themselves as well. So it runs much deeper for people or companies or CEOs that understand that. So you go to the food waste specifically, which we're very happy about that, the, uh, that this forum and the P4G uh, is part of this actively. Uh, Indonesia itself, 250 million people. We just came from that with the conference in Bali where, where we were all. 11% of the people still living in poverty, most of them subsistent farmers. It causes a lot of other issues across total society if you don't address that. So 30 to 40% of the food waste alone in Indonesia is probably depriving all of these farmers from a decent livelihood in the first place and keeping them into poverty. We've put a lot of people together under the Food and Land Use Alliance uh, from all different parts of the value chain uh, to work together to address that. We started in the UK, we've done it in the US, we've done it in the Netherlands, now in Denmark, and anywhere we look at this food loss in the value chain, we find a return of uh, 14 times the investment that we make easily, easily. 99% of the companies that participated um, reported a positive return. So you take Unilever, if you want to have one soundbite of a company, uh, if 25% of food or 50% 50, 50 of our food in the value chain gets lost, 40-50%, you cut that by half, which is the objective here. For a company like ours, it would actually save us easily with our scale, four or five hundred million dollars. That's what we're talking about. For us, actually, it's not a question, uh, may I say, of just cutting food waste and saving money. For us, it's important to attack the issue of 840 million people going to bed hungry. Uh, my point is always, how do we have the audacity to waste in our value chain when we deny the basic human rights of people to have a little bit of food in their bellies? So that creates a lot of energy. We need to do that, obviously, in the countries of scale now, not only in the Netherlands or Denmark. Uh, Indonesia is a great example of that. And the Indonesian government, obviously, is, is fully cooperative. You need the governments to put frameworks in place. We've seen that in every country. Uh, just simple moves of uh, buy by date to use by date, or sell by date to use by date can make a big difference. Putting in uh, technology at the farmer's level, offered information, storage systems, infrastructure, the right rules and regulations around that. And that requires, obviously, the uh, partnership of everybody. When and where we do it, it's actually low-hanging fruits, just to not, uh, but that uh, you quickly can get to the 20%, and with a little bit of effort, you get the other 30% uh, fairly quickly as well. And again, I just want to stop there and not say it's a, a cost-saving thing. And, uh, you know, by the way, food touches all the SDGs. That's what I like. It starts with poverty, goal number two, food security. It's gender equality. It's keeping people out of education. It's destroying our... Uh, uh, land, our oceans, our forests. Uh, so it touches all of the SDGs. Not attacking the food and land use issue would result in us not achieving the SDGs. Yeah. Thanks very much. And I'm looking over here to Denmark's advocate uh, on food waste, Selina Yule, and I hope you are tweeting all these important messages uh, out. I don't see your cell phone in your hand, Selina. <laughs> She's got it. Okay, very good. Let me come next uh, to Sir and School. And uh, we talked about skills uh, with the Deputy Prime Minister. I'd like to ask you about new technologies and partnering in the area of new technologies. I know that you're working with IBM to develop a blockchain and AI-based 
platform. And I wonder if you can just say a word about how collaborating on new technologies of that sort also boosts our ability to meet uh, our global goals. And perhaps, again, uh, a question whether the returns from that mainly flow to Maersk's corporate headquarters or whether they are, uh, have ripple effects beyond that. So, so we believe that, uh, that uh, you know, a lot can still be, do, uh, be done to make global trade much more efficient, actually allowing even the smallest company to sell its, uh, its, its goods and its products in, in any market in, that is relevant in, in, in the world. Uh, we have worked very hard to make the cost of transportation very low over the last 30, 40 years, and we have succeeded with that to the point that very, you know, most companies today, when they decide where to manufacture, you know, the global transportation cost is not really a big uh, factor. But the whole paper trail, all of the yeah. bureaucracy around global trade has, 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 has not gotten a lot of the attention, and it actually involves a lot of paperwork, a lot of stamping, a lot of, yeah, bureaucracy to trade. And, and blockchain is, uh, is an opportunity to actually deal with that, to create more visibility in the supply chain, more transparency, less opportunity for rent-seeking or corruption, uh, and, and that's why we are working on, uh, uh, on, on that. Blockchain is also, uh, I think, a, a tool that will be used to improve food safety because you will actually be able to trace every single uh, element that goes into a, a, a food product uh, through these uh, digital, uh, digital means. So that, that will also be an important development, I think. And just one very brief word, if you would, about what gains other actors, including in the developing markets uh, that you work with, what they might see from this. Clearly, it's going to be good for Mask. Is it also good for others? No, but if you want to do what, what, what Paul talks about, which is, I think, is very important to move people out of being subsistence farmers, you need to create a marketplace for them. You need, you need them to, 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 to actually uh, grow, grow goods that they can sell, not just eat. Uh, and, 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 and for that, we need a, we need a, we need a better trade system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me now ask Isbran Ho also to share a bit of your experience on the ground, quite concretely, in partnering, particularly on this electric bus program. You mentioned your work with London, with other cities as well, but maybe you can just give us a couple of examples of what kind of partners are driving this forward with you and how that is working in practice, again, for win-win gains for all? It is a little bit of a revolution indeed. The whole electric bus adventure that I started six years ago, nobody believed in it in the beginning. And then Transport for London, then our partner at ADL, Alexander Dennis. The partnership basically encompassed the trust element. I think a lot of people don't have that trust element in place. We try to approach large companies, the legacy brands who are making buses uh, in Germany in particular, and none of them refused to talk to us. And we as a company, we started our legacy from energy, from battery manufacturing. That's how BYD started. We did not start it as an electric bus company. We actually started as an electric bus company by accident. <laughs> by accident, by the fact that people refuse to talk to us. And if any of you out there have seen or met with my chairman, you would know that he's a person that would not take no for an answer. So when we approached a partner six years ago to build the buses together, where we supply the energy system, the powertrain, the control system, they said, please go away. So with that, he decided to build his own electric buses. And I think the partnership is all about trust and also about understanding each other. When I spent two years courting Alexander Dennis, there was a lot of mistrust, distrust, uh, guessing game. Is this Chinese company going to buy this small Scottish company? The relationship is four years down the road, and it's stronger than ever. In fact, we're expanding the partnership from just UK to now Asia we'll be developing our first buses for Hong Kong. So the partnership is very important. It's not just about looking for business opportunities. Of course, business opportunity is one thing. Okay? But the fact is, you are doing something good to sustain what we want to create here in this forum. The other thing that I want to add is, we're blowing up the whole industry. 
in the sense that the bus industry is very old school. Everybody knows everybody. If I walk into Movia, the person who worked worked in Movia 25 years ago will know Mr. Peterson and know the next bus driver. We're blowing up the whole industry by creating a partnership with energy company, for example. Energy companies they've never been a partner in the transportation. They have been a supplier. But today we're working with energy company so that we can produce batteries. A kiosk, so that long-distance coaches can be possible now. So we can actually have electric buses traveling 800 miles, a thousand miles, by turning the petrol kiosks into energy kiosks. So these are the partnership that we're continuing exploring, and it is is important to go beyond the boundaries and not looking at the current business models.、Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, three messages we can take with us into our discussions on partnership throughout the summit, and that is trust, persistence, if not stubbornness, and thinking outside of the box, looking for how you can break out of those patterns、uh, of the past. Andrew Steer, last word to you. You and I meet、uh, at various fora、uh, when、uh, we are on our international journeys, and the fact is, so much of the time, I think we have the feeling that maybe we're preaching to the choir, to those who actually have already gotten the message. How do we take this incredibly important message beyond that group? How do we get wider buy-in、um, on the need to partner in order to accelerate our progress toward our goals? Well, a very good-looking choir out here, I see.、Um, <laughs> Not、uh, only in this room, <laughs> other ones as well. So, 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 so we need sticky messages, and we need messengers that are trusted. Preaching from people like me won't do it. So, who are the messengers?、Um, well, one we're going to deal with the next session: financial markets, most powerful messengers of all. Corporations listen to financial markets. Uh, governments listen to financial markets. Work with financial markets as they look at the facts and gradually green investors. Another group of powerful ambassadors, young people. I mean, how wonderful that we're talking about education. Young people matter not only because they are going to have huge buying power; they matter because they're looking for jobs. We are working with a number of companies right now on the link between. Good environmental and social performance of a company, and the ability to attract good people. Many companies at the moment in the wrong industries that don't have good reputations simply can't attract them. And by the way, I should say, Paul, that Unilever is regarded as the gold standard, and they actually have data from Unilever as to the kinds of people that they can attract from the best universities, and they say they want they want a piece of that. So, in other words, young people as messengers, new technology, very powerful messages. You know why are the forests of Indonesia and and Malaysia and Southeast Asia being lost? Two words: palm oil. <laughs> you and I are the problem. We consume palm oil every day. Getting the message all the way from consumers through retailers to manufacturers to traders, all the way down to farmers. How do you do it? Modern technology, even blockchain, can help.、Uh, we run something called Global Forest Watch with other、uh, with other. Uh, uh, partners, we can see、uh, trees falling down to one tenth of a hectare every single week. Go and talk to some of the traders and the and the producers out out in、uh, Southeast Asia, and you can show actually here's where you're allowed to cut. Here's what was cut last week, and over time you can show a picture. And so little by little, those are coming on board.、Um, finally, I said you know preaching doesn't work, but actually. Preaching by the right people does work.、Um, when the Pope,、uh, you know, came out with Laudato Si, you imagine the the 1.2 billion Catholics in the world, for example. At the end of the day, this is as much about an issue of the heart as it is an issue of the bottom line. And one of the reasons why we're seeing the leadership today is not only because it's good for profits; it's because we have some industries, at least, that are led by people who have a heart that want to actually make the world a better place. And we should never, ever underestimate that. Thank you very much. Wonderful last words for this panel. Let's give all of them a very warm round of applause, please. Thank you very much, gentlemen.
Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard some uh, very resounding statements about the importance of the financial sector, of getting that sector involved, and also of getting real innovation in that sector. That's the topic when we come back from our break. Our next panel will address that issue with leaders from that sector.